Good afternoon, colleagues. You know, b before I, I um, share with you this synthesis, um, which I hope uh, will do justice to our discussions over the past uh, two and a half days, I want to tell you a story. This is a story about a very famous wise woman. Uh, this woman was very famous, she was well known throughout her, her region because she had the power to answer any question. She had wisdom. And there were two little girls in the village near where this wise woman lived that decided that there must be something that this wise woman doesn't know. There has to be something. So they decided that they will try to prove that there is something this wise woman doesn't know. So they had a plot. This was their plan. That they would make an appointment, they would request to have audience with a wise woman. And when their turn comes, they will enter. And they would have a butterfly. One of them would have a butterfly in their hands. And they would ask the wise woman, dear wise woman, what do I have behind me? And the wise woman would answer. And that if the wise woman got it right, they would ask, in which hand is it? Is it the left hand or the right hand? And if the wise woman got it right, then they would ask, is the butterfly dead or alive? If she says it's alive, they would crush it and say it's dead. And if she says it's dead, they would release it and say it's alive. So this was their plot. So they arrived at the appointed time, and they waited their turn, and then they entered. And they had audience with a wise woman, and the wise woman asked, my dear children, how can I help you? So they asked, what do I have behind my back? So the wise woman said, you have a butterfly, my child. And then they said, which hand is it? So the wise woman answered, it's in your left hand, my child. And then they asked, is the butterfly dead or alive? And the wise woman replied, that, my dear child, is entirely in your hands. <laughs> so, <laughs> the essence of the story really is that we gathered here under the auspices of Africa Climate Talks. And what was the motivation that brought us uh, to, together uh, here? We came together motivated by this huge responsibility that we have that the COP21 negotiations should generate an outcome that guarantees a global development trajectory that is equitable to all humankind. And we came here because of this belief that the future of this planet is entirely in our hands. That the future of Africa, of this continent, is entirely uh, in our hands. And that we owe it to ourselves to come together, to participate, to raise our voices, to occupy the space that is being created for us, this democratic space, for us to express our views and our opinions, and for us to listen to the diversity of views from different levels, the diversity of views from the youth, uh, from the negotiators, uh, from government representatives, from civil society organizations. At the nucleus of this motivation that has brought us together is the belief that climate change is a human issue. It's a human issue that impacts on livelihoods. That it is about our economic systems. It is about our human vulnerabilities, and it is about our well-being. It is about who decides and in whose interest. What are the trade-offs? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? It is about what will shape how we govern our resources. It is about having to acknowledge that the boundaries of ecosystems are going to move. Where the forests are today, they may not be there tomorrow because of climate change. 
As we came together, we talked, and I listened to what the foundational issues are that are bringing us together, what the voices were saying. And one of the first things was that if we are to counter global warming, then the COP21 outcomes need to mainstream adaptation and mitigation into Africa's development objectives. And this is necessary given the dependence of Africa's economies on climate vulnerable sectors such as the agriculture, tourism, and the marine and fresh ecosystems. The costs of damages and losses are going to be substantial. So the negotiations would need to address the loss and damages. The key interests for Africa are to maintain the essence of the founding principles of the UNFCCC. These principles are still seen to be relevant. They are since still seen to be important for Africa going forward. Over the course of these days, we heard the mention of precautionary principle. We heard the mention of sustainable development. We heard the mention of common but differentiated responsibilities. We heard about the polluter pays. So these issues were seen to be important moving forward. They're the founding principles of the UNFCCC. There was a clear recognition that Africa is a diverse continent. There was a clear recognition of the differences between countries, but that despite these differences, we must continue to speak with one voice. And that as we go to COP21, our strength will be in our ability to speak with one voice. We had a certain sense of a real skepticism about the voluntary targets being set under the intended nationally determined contributions. Will these voluntary contributions add up to the required level to keep global warming within the internationally agreed limit of two degrees Celsius. The sense of this body was not convinced and the real strong skepticism. So how do we position ourselves for successful negotiations? So we talked about the whole issue of knowledge and policy linkages that we need to move beyond this elitist notion of climate science, that we need to include local lessons, indigenous knowledge, and local practices, and that we need to learn from what is working and communicate what is working. And that as we move ahead, there is a need to begin to bring the biophysical and the social sciences together to define a more compelling African agenda that can address Africa's vulnerability and lead to greater prosperity for the continent. We lamented the inadequacy of funding for climate change, but there needs to be more African investment in research so that we can generate policy relevant solutions that respond to the dynamic nature of Africa's development aspirations. This knowledge and policy linkage must address how knowledge is generated, how knowledge is delivered, and how that knowledge is used. We cannot just say the policy makers must work it out, must sort it out. It is also incumbent upon those that are generating this information to also think how they generate this information and how it can be accessible to the potential end users. In positioning ourselves, we need to focus on Africa's prosperity. We need to demonstrate our commitment to a just transition to Africa's prosperity. In this journey, the voices of civil society, especially of the youth, are critically important because they serve as a guide to decision makers. They serve as a platform for new ideas. So this requires that we re-examine existing solutions. And as was mentioned in the discussions, we cannot do the same thing every day 
and expect a different outcome. The centrality of learning platforms needs to be examined as part of our positioning within the context of the climate change negotiations. Local communities around Africa are generating solutions to cope with climate change that need to be acknowledged, they need to be communicated, we need to be shared. We need to understand what is working, why it is working. We need to understand and learn from those lessons of things that are not working. The youth are our future. The women are our economic backbone. So we need a specific focus that engages the youth and the women in the climate change process. Learning is a key capacity for finding solutions and innovation. So this requires that information is co-created in order to generate the knowledge that we require. We need to hear all the voices. We need to hear the voices of the key actors. We need to hear the voices of those that bear the costs of climate change, including the women. We need to build alliances. We need to build a broad democratic alliance to address climate change. This entails that we build trust. This was one of the themes that came up in our conversations. We need to find commonalities and we need to recognize uh, our difference. We need to forge partnerships with the youth, with civil society, with the private sector, with negotiators, with rural voices, and again, with those that are the backbone of our economies, the women. We need to take a page from the encyclical that was issued by Pope Francis. In these messages, how can we focus on the humanity? How can we have a conversation about how climate change is going to affect uh, our humanity? And as was said yesterday, no matter where you sit, you can be in your own little boat and say or think that when the storm hits, you are okay in your little corner of the world. Yesterday the message was clear. We are all going to be in the same stewing pot. So it's really important that we have this conversation about the impact of climate change on our humanity. Our governments have a fundamental responsibility to sustainable management of natural resources and to environmental sustainability. We need jointly with our governments to seek solutions. The governments have to step forward. The governments have to renew their commitment, their obligations to their citizens, including to future generations. We need to establish clear legal processes. We need to address legal violations. We need to respect fundamental rights. We need to recognize the role, authority, and inclusion of all custodians and users in environmental management. We need to ensure voice and participation. I keep repeating, women and youth, they are both the future and the backbone. And they will be essential in ensuring appropriate solutions, but also the inclusion of new ideas. So we need to find creative climate solutions and innovation. We need to achieve more effective, more equitable solutions for adaptation, for agriculture. We heard yesterday that we cannot compromise on food security and the right to food. And we need to embrace adaptation and mitigation. We need to recognize the need for multiple strategies, not just a single strategy. The complexity requires us to look at the whole suite of strategies. And that our solutions have to go beyond projects. We need to scale up. We need to focus on large scale and longer term resilience. So what do we want to achieve in the negotiations? So of course finance was top of the agenda. We want to ensure adequate climate uh, finance. We want to access finance and we know that in this process it has been constrained by multiple and complex funding requirements 
that are not in themselves coordinated. So really moving forward, we're looking for simplified and better coordination in terms of accessing uh, climate finance. But at the same time, there was a clear message uh, coming from uh, everybody here that a Africa needs to be make greater efforts to define innovative ways of mobilizing domestic resources. And domestic can be at the national level or at the regional level. And in some cases, including the establishment of community banks. In our eagerness to mobilize climate finance, we should be cautious about our approach to loans. We should be cautious about how we manage debt. The issue of capacities and capabilities, this, there was a discussion about that. There was a discussion about what do we mean. We talk very generally about capacity building, but really this is about capacities and capabilities. We need to be clear. What are the needs? Where are these needs? Who needs a capacitation and who needs what capabilities? And only then are we able to target and to invest uh, effectively and efficiently um, in strengthening these uh, capacities. The issue of technology, that clearly the meaning of appropriate technology needs to be defined. Otherwise, we end up with the wrong technologies to address the, the wrong solutions. Adoption of technologies should consider the impact on labor. And we heard the great dependency of uh, many people on agriculture, that agriculture is a significant employer of people on the continent. So as we look at technologies, how do we uh, take on board the impact on labor? Technology development and technology transfer should be matched to Africa's needs. So what is the bottom line for Africa? Are we in this at all cost? The answer clearly is no. And this raises the unanswered question of whether Africa should walk away from the negotiations if there is no appetite to support its development aspirations. Post Kyoto should not become a mechanism for market expansion with other countries de designing solutions for Africans. We need Africans designing technologies, designing solutions that are appropriate and that are responsive to African aspirations. We are not at the negotiations with the begging bowl. We need to engage with confidence. We need to engage with a self-belief in ourselves, a belief that is based on our strengths. There was a very, very powerful um, uh, presentation yesterday about how the discourse around climate change has been driven by a certain paradigm, a paradigm that is patriarchal. <clears throat> so we need to examine this paradigm, and we need to examine the solutions that are coming out of these paradigms, the solutions that are informing the climate change discourse. We want to be able to ensure that we don't reproduce the existing systems of domination, the existing systems of exclusion, and the existing systems of marginal, uh, marginalization, especially uh, of women. So that's really the synthesis. That's the essence of the message that I got over the past uh, two, or two and a half days. And I hope that this uh, does uh, adequate justice and captures. This was not an attempt to summarize everything that was said uh, in every session, but really to provide uh, an essence, a key message of what is coming out of this uh, Africa Climate Talks. So with that, thank you very much.